Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Hypernica uh, and Seren in particular for organizing and uh, inviting me to come and address you. Uh, welcome to the conference uh, and uh, sit back um, and relax uh, and uh, enjoy, enjoy at least or bask for a moment in the uh, interest and unique window of opportunity that I think Africa does present us all. Uh, we're living, I think, through historic times in terms of Africa's stage of development. And I think taking advantage of these historic times is clearly the challenge, a challenge, I might add, fraught with all sorts of uncertainties. I hope during the course of this presentation to present you with some uh, good motivation uh, for those of you looking at Africa and, of course, looking at the broader uh, socio-political and economic scene uh, in South Africa as well. Uh, following my talk, we will have a uh, panel discussion, which will look at uh, some of the more some of the aspects of what I'm going to talk about in a little more detail, and hopefully also get some input from you. So, uh, without further ado, um, let me uh, uh, let me just sort of set the scene in a sense for where we've come from in the world and some of the core issues that I think are important. And let me just go back uh, four or five years, uh, 2008, the global financial crisis, a particular crisis in Europe to a lesser extent in the United States, but no less important. That was an advert on the London underground for the British magazine, The Spectator. I tell you, it wasn't very pleasant if you happen to be Greek and you were traveling through uh, London. It wasn't very pleasant for that matter if you were German to be reminded constantly that you effectively had bailed out some of the peripheral and or troublesome European countries. We've gone through very, very rough times in Europe and every single European country really fell in some sort of domino effect uh, to the uh, vagaries and negativity of the global financial crisis. After the Greeks effectively went into default, the Spaniards said Spain is not Greece, expecting not to fall into the same trap. And of course we know that Spain indeed also went into a severe economic decline. Well, the Portuguese didn't want to be seen to be falling into the same decline, and they said Portugal is not Greece, or as it was said by the economist, everyone got it wrong for that matter. Greece is not Ireland, said the Greek finance minister. Ireland went through great difficulties during that particular period. Spain is neither Ireland nor Portugal, said the Spanish finance minister. Ireland is not in Greek territory, said the Irish finance minister. Neither Spain nor Portugal is Ireland, said the secretary general of the OECD. Italy is not Spain, said the head of Fitch. Italy, we know, ran into severe difficulties, of course. Spain is not Uganda, said the Spanish Prime Minister. And I think most importantly of all, the Ugandan Foreign Minister said Uganda does not want to be Spain. And indeed, if you go back to 2011, more or less, and you look at a comparative set of figures between Uganda and Spain, an unusual two countries to compare, I must tell you, you'll see that Uganda doesn't look that bad when compared to Spain. And in fact, in many instances, Uganda's economy looked a lot healthier back in 2011. Oil reserves, a billion barrels of oil in Uganda, in Spain, 150 million. GDP growth, six or seven times that of Spain. Not bad, Uganda. Debt, look at debt. In the trillions for Spain, in the billions for Uganda, and not bad for Uganda. And debt to GDP, for that matter, again, uh, more than double, well over double uh, in Spain when compared to Uganda. Now, I know uh, it's, uh, you know, one's not really comparing apples with apples in a sense, but ultimately, I think it gives you an idea that we've changed our focus of the world. We've changed our focus when looking at countries that perhaps we would have excluded from the investment equation 10 years ago. And I think this represents, I think it might be anecdotal, it might be quirky, but it represents a substantial mind shift for all of us. And no doubt all of you here are experiencing that mind shift. You're experiencing that in your pockets in terms of where your business contracts are now located. For the Europeans and for the Americans, in a sense, uh, they can breathe a sigh of relief. They're off the worst of the global financial crisis. U.S. economic growth has ticked up relatively well. It's been a little volatile in the last quarter of last year. But still, nevertheless, there's an upward trajectory for U.S. economic growth. 
for Europe, for most of the countries in Europe, particularly even the troublesome countries of Greece and Spain and Portugal, those GDP trend lines are just starting to look a little bit better, just in positive territory. The UK, in fact, has enjoyed its best quarter GDP-wise since before the economic crisis. So there's a little bit of an improvement coming out of Europe. And when we look at some of the GDP estimates forecast over the course of the next two years from the IMF, you will see that, uh, yes, the U.S. looks as though it's going to grow at about 2.8 or 3 percent perhaps by 2015. Not a bad increase given its perilous state only a couple of years ago. The Eurozone, just in positive territory, growing at a predicted 1 percent for this year and perhaps 1.4 percent for 2015. Emerging economies in general of the world still growing healthily at 5, 5.5 percent. China ticking along relatively well at over 7 percent. And look at that figure circled for Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa growing at 6.1% expected for this year compared to South Africa. And those figures taken back in uh, two months ago have already been revised downwards for South African GDP, which we'll come to right now. The interest in the emerging markets, the interest in Africa in particular, continued relative buoyancy in China, and I'll come back to that in a moment, clearly bode well for the global environment. But can the same be said for South Africa? And that, I suppose, is the real question. And, you know, I don't want to be a sort of a, 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 a naysayer or a doomsayer here in this particular talk, but when we look at the South African economy, we look at the serious impediments to economic growth, and we look at the results of a policy malaise over the course of the last five or ten years, we now see the effects, and we see the effects quite strongly in our economy. Lagging growth in fixed investment that needs to be kick-started, and kick-started relatively quickly. Mining as a uh, percentage of GDP, of course, that trend line has fallen and fallen dramatically over the course of the last 10 years. It's a very telling graph in terms of a trend line of the contribution of mining to South African GDP. And all of you know in your industry that if these trend lines continue to move south, investment opportunities within the South African country itself, within our borders, will remain extremely sluggish. In the mining industry in particular, we have to contend with a high degree of labor militancy, productivity issues, above average wage demands, power shortages and the effects, the negative effects on our economy of ESCOM, and of course, policy uncertainties, uncertainty, uh, uncertainty over ownership, the continued cloud of resource nationalism that is creeping into our debate. And clearly, this is a disincentive to investment in South Africa and a disincentive in terms of the very, very big cash-intensive capital investments that this country really needs to kickstart itself into the future. And clearly, an impediment, in a sense, to your industry. It's not just in uh, uh, the heavy capex industries, although manufacturing itself can be a heavy capex industry. Uh, manufacturing per uh, percentage of South Africa's GDP has also declined quite dramatically, again, over the course of the last decade or so. We simply haven't been able to effectively kickstart our economy out of the malaise in which it finds itself. So we hold out hope, as we always do. We hold out hope that having appointed his new cabinet only last night, we will at last be able to attempt to start to implement aspects of the National Development Plan in South Africa, which call for a complete rejig of South Africa's economy, raising employment through faster economic growth, improving education, skills development, clearly an innovation, and of course building the capability and capacity of the state in South Africa, which I would regard as being critically important. How do we build the capability and capacity of the state? We, of course, do it in two ways. We can do it through infrastructure, and we can do it through the planned infrastructure rollout. Now, I must tell you, I should live long enough on this planet in order to see this infrastructure rollout in South Africa. It's been on the budget, uh, uh, on the budget books now for a few years. And we're still a little sluggish, to put it mildly. Some of you involved with this will still find it a little sluggish to get those contracts signed with government in terms of this massive rollout. Infrastructure is great. Infrastructure, as we know, is going to drive economies. But infrastructure also has to be combined with policy efficiencies, with good policies that understand the competitive nature of the world, that offer pragmatic solutions to make our country a highly attractive FDI destination and not to discourage investors. So infrastructure is really only one side of the equation. 
And when all of us, because all of us in a sense in this room are in the infrastructure industry, I suppose directly or indirectly, we should really at the same time be lobbying for infrastructure and prudent economic policies to go hand in hand in order to take ourselves into the next phase of our what should be a reindustrialization of South Africa. The graphs continually show and the budgetary allocations continually show in South Africa, budget after budget, the allocations for this huge infrastructure spend that I don't think will meet its targets by 2016. But nevertheless, I think we must hold out hope that in the second Zuma term of office, the NDP becomes a focus and perhaps the easiest part of the National Development Plan is the infrastructure rollout because it's politically popular. It's politically popular from all sides of the political equation. The left, the unions, the communists, the business groupings all like the idea of infrastructure. You don't have to get your head around it ideologically in order to implement an infrastructure development program. And in a sense, one should and I will continue to hold out hope and indeed for this industry that it might not just be looking across border, we may well see this coming to fruition in South Africa. Go to Transnet's uh, capital uh, expenditure plans for the next 10 years, you see also a tremendous increase in, uh, in budgets and allocations. Let's hope and let's lobby that this indeed becomes reality over the course of the last, uh, uh, over the next few years. Ultimately, for our political system here in South Africa, we, urgent, we urgently need policy clarity within South Africa. We urgently need to, of course, balance the redistributive role of the state and state intervention in the economy in order to uplift the poor with encouraging the private and business sector to remain in South Africa, to invest in South Africa, and to play its rightful part in the country. This balancing act is perhaps what has been missing from our policy equation in this country over the course, certainly of the last five years. There are still differing views within the ruling alliance as to how to react to the business side of our uh, political and uh, economic space in South Africa, and that has to be resolved clearly before we move into the next phase of our uh, industrialization and economic development. So a lot rests, I must tell you, uh, in the hands of Cyril Ross Knight, became deputy president of South Africa. Perhaps the most interesting appointment of the cabinet really was his appointment. He was out of parliament. He didn't play an active role, of course, other than within the ANC. He is now deputy president of South Africa. He was one of the driving forces behind the national development plan. And ultimately, perhaps his position will rest on whether he can attempt to steer the wayward unions in South Africa into accepting elements of the NDP that can be implemented. It's going to be a tough task. Uh, on his shoulders. The South African economy and in your industry in particular in the cement industry is going to be buffeted by a number of very big global changes, very big macro trade changes. They apply in the African context, continental African context, just as they do here in our country. Urbanization, changes in the management and planning, spatial development of our cities in South Africa, critical into the future. We cannot go on living with these sprawling informal settlements. They affect absolutely everything in particular, and you've just got to be basic about it, the quality of life of ordinary South Africans to participate fully in our country. And clearly, I think there's a big challenge in South Africa to reinvigorate our cities, to densify our cities, to bring your technologies, in particular sustainable technologies, but your technologies and the quality of your technologies into the densification of our cities. I think this is going to be one of the core challenges for us. It's an African challenge, it's a South African challenge as well. A further challenge clearly in the cement industry is the uh, importation of uh, cement uh, now largely coming from Pakistan. Lucky cement is uh, perhaps a, a word I shouldn't mention um, at a conference like this. Uh, we've seen in this country a 40% growth in imported cement, most of it from Pakistan, as it happens over the course um, of the last year. A 40% increase in imports and a five-fold increase over the course of the last four years in imported cement. And we know that imported cement may well, in a sense, be perhaps not what it should be in terms of safety regulations, um, and in terms of adequate standards. 
all of you probably familiar, if you're from this industry, in that particular incident in Tongart in KZN, although we don't quite know yet, I think, the full extent of the inquiry into that particular building collapse. Nevertheless, I think it's a challenge, and it's a, one of the many challenges to doing business. There's a political challenge in South Africa, there's a policy challenge in South Africa, there's the role of cheap imports into South Africa, or of perhaps a lesser quality, um, and of course, all of you are faced with a world, a world which is becoming a lot more competitive in every aspect of all of our businesses, whatever they may be. There are new entrants into the marketplace, some coming from afar, uh, and I think these new entrants are creating a very, very crowded market, perhaps even an overcrowded market, particularly in your industry here in South Africa. So there are challenges, certainly, in the South African context. The biggest challenge, I suppose, for all of you is the fact that our growth in South Africa simply has been lagging, our GDP growth. We really can't continue along a trajectory of 2% GDP growth. We have to up our growth to 5 or 6% as the NDP would like us to have for the next 20 years or so. I'm not sure whether we're going to get to those levels sustainably for 20 years. We've never had those levels for 20 years ever in the history of South Africa. But when you look at South Africa's GDP when compared to other African countries, then I think you realize that the excitement, in a sense, is perhaps across our borders. The excitement is elsewhere. If we can, if we can reinvigorate our own national development plan, maybe, maybe, the excitement will return to South Africa. So with those remarks about South Africa, it brings me to, of course, at the focus of this conference indirectly, I suppose, and the title of my talk is Tracking Africa's Future. And if we go back to, 20, to the year 2000, go back to the year 2000, look at this rather good magazine that I like to read every week. I use some of its resources in my research, but didn't they get it wrong in a sense back in 2000 when The Economist magazine called Africa the hopeless continent? It then reviewed its position about Africa a decade later. And in fact, in the second article in 2010, The Economist apologized for the fact that they got it wrong back in the year 2000. Look, this African growth story, certainly in terms of the statistical evidence that we have uh, at our disposal, has been quite remarkable. It really is almost a final frontier um, of economic growth in the world, and we've seen it exponentially grow, certainly in GDP terms, in the course of the last decade. When I talk about Africa, and all of us talk about Africa, I think that there should always be a caveat it's a big continent with diverse countries, with diverse regions, diverse cultures and languages and historical linkages as well. And I'm very mindful to paint the whole continent with one big brush, but you know, us analysts tend to do that. I think it's always good at the outset of any presentation just to bring one back to reality, that what works in one particular area may not necessarily work in another particular area or region. The vagaries of Africa are intense and very, very deep, and coming to terms with those vagaries are one of the ultimate challenges to business that uh, intend to expand uh, into the continent. Different countries, different development cycles, oil exporters, diversified economies, uh, economies in transition or pre-transition economies, we can study and analyze the African countries really for hours and hours. It's a very complex environment, and all of these countries effectively have a complex set of advantages and, of course, a complex set of obstacles. From limited access to financing in Nigeria, to political instability in Egypt, to macroeconomic conditions uh, and uh, instability in many other African countries as well. Different levels of development, different levels of, uh, of concern. And on the issue of concern, uh, of course, uh, doing business in Africa and looking at the continent fraught with risk and fraught with difficulties. We know what's been happening certainly in Nigeria, not just on this particular issue, I might add, but also on the uh, ongoing uh, problems with Boko Haram. We know what's been happening in East Africa, and I was in Nairobi on the weekend of the Westgate Mall incident, I must tell you. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't anywhere near that mall, but it brought it home, having been so close to that particular issue, that Africa certainly has its issues, and its issues in very major powerhouses, the East African and both, both West African powerhouses of Nigeria and Kenya. We know that Africa suffers from problems relating to corruption, 
Take a look at that corruption perception index. Countries shaded in red, and that actually applies to most of the world, I must tell you, not just Africa, uh, certainly falling foul of uh, transparency uh, in many aspects of governance. But with all of that, with all of that, the projected growth for most countries on this continent over the course of the next five years is substantial. Four, five, six, seven percent average growth for most of these countries over the course of the next five years. That is startling and it is amazing and I tell you very, very positive for our industry. Africa's economies are no longer small, they're no longer insignificant. Angola is now a hundred billion dollar plus economy. I like that picture of Luanda. Any, anybody here from Angola? I like that picture of Luanda. It looks a little bit like the French Riviera, I must tell you. It just shows you how things are changing in Africa. We've gone from the BRICS countries to the Mint countries. Now we talk about the King group of countries. Kenya, the Ivory Coast, Nigeria and Ghana. BRICS, no, nah, it's come and gone. It's now the King group of countries. There's an excitement about Africa that has to, again, be tempered. All of this excitement by issues affecting business that have gone in to parts of Africa and in some cases very good, very fine businesses who have got a little unstuck in what they've done, as we've seen in our press in South Africa only over the course of the last week with Tiger Brands and their, ent their entry, or as the Business Day article refers to, their misadventure in Nigeria. But there are a number of very good reasons to like Africa. And they are deeply embedded reasons that point to sustainable growth. Despite ex rising external financing costs and a deceleration in key export markets like the EU uh, and even subdued commodity prices, sub-Saharan Africa over the course of the last number of years has been able to show sustained growth. So given that the EU still plays a very important role in African economies uh, and given a global financial crisis, Africa's sustainable growth in the last few years has been solid and it hasn't flagged. That is a positive. It indicates to me that there are legs to the African growth story. Government debt in Africa is still under control. I think it's creeping up in many African countries and it's true to say that many African countries still don't have high levels of government debt simply because they do not provide, they don't provide a, a cushion uh, to their populace. Uh, as we do in South Africa, where we have, of course, uh, social income grants and pensions for 15, 16 million South Africans, this, I think, is yet to take root in Africa. And as I think Africans move into the middle classes, as I think these economies develop, um, this level of debt to GDP, government debt in particular in Africa, could very well rise into the future. But for the moment, still relatively manageable in terms of global comparisons. Inflation across Africa has dropped and it's dropped more or less to below GDP growth rates. And that's pretty good news for the continent as well. And what I like about Africa, it's understanding full well that the way to becoming competitive, in a sense, is to find partners, not necessarily business partners, but partners with your neighbor. And I think this uh, consolidation of Africa's trading blocks is a critical part of Africa's future success. It will alleviate bottlenecks, I think it will cut red tape. We know that the improvement of visa regimes, particularly coming out of the Eastern African uh, trading corridor, I think is going to be one of the big pluses in doing business in that particular area. And I think this will, ex will extend indeed to West Africa and elsewhere as well. So I think there's a big, you know, there are a number of good reasons to like Africa, and it's not just me saying this. We can just see where the new foreign direct investment hotspots are across the continent. There are no real surprises. As usual, it's East Africa, it's West Africa, it's Mozambique, it's Southern Africa as well. Uh, but still, uh, these are the key growth areas for the continent. Africa has become in vogue, uh, strange enough, not just, of course, because of what Africans have been doing, but it's become in vogue because of external factors. Of course, that's the great migration that takes place uh, on the East African plains uh, every single year. And there's been a great migration of capital across the world as a result of the global financial crisis, as a result of a very, very low interest rates in the Western world. Investors are looking for a return on investment. And they've taken risks in the last five years. They've expanded their horizons to move beyond uh, the United States and Western Europe and Japan and Southeast Asia to look for more, greater returns on investment from developing markets and in particular from Africa. And it's remarkable the quantity of investment vehicles that now come from this continent. It's put Africa on the map.
So ironically, in a sense, the global financial crisis has had a positive effect on Africa. It's put Africa effectively uh, on the front burner of investment opportunities. It may be risky to many, but now it's a seriously considered avenue for investment. Of course, with the migration of capital to Africa can very well come the migration of capital from Africa should governance in Africa remain fragile and not live up to its promise. So there's a, a double-edged sword, I suppose, to the ease of movement of capital today in the world. We know it can come and it can go. It can flow both ways, literally at the click of a mouse, and Africa has to be warned certainly about, about that. A positive for Africa certainly has been the global bond issues from so many African countries that have been taken up and taken up so readily. These global bond issues have raised capital clearly, but they've shown that there's confidence. There's confidence from investors looking to diversify their portfolios. And this has clearly been uh, exciting. It's also offered, I think, many of these countries to raise capital and, of course, to contemplate building uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure is not just an African feature. It's a feature of the broader global world and the feature of the developing world, and in particular, a feature, of course, of global giants like China. This is a city in China called Chongqing. I always put a picture of the city into every presentation that I do because you may not have heard of Chongqing here in the audience. Some of you might have a holiday home in Chongqing or a yacht on the rather muddy looking river that encircles Chongqing. But why do I put Chongqing into my presentation? Because this city has a population of 30 million people in the greater Chongqing area. 30 million. 50 years ago, there were 250,000 people living here. It was a relatively small village in uh, the Chinese uh, parlance. Uh, people have moved from rural to urban uh, in this part of China and elsewhere across that great country. They want, they want security. They want commodity security. This is another city in China. I've showed you, I've showed you uh, uh, Chongqing. I'll take you now to a city called Qingdao. Qingdao up in northern China. Northern China, I was up in Qingdao. Uh, I, I was taken there by the Chinese government, a very interesting trip. And my host said to me, Daniel, you've got a free day in uh, Qingdao. What would you like to do? Would you like to go to the beach? <laughs> or, uh, indeed, yes, indeed. Or would you like to go and visit the local brewery? And you know they've got a very fine beer in Qingdao, as I found out. Surprise, surprise, I took the brewery tour. But when you take a look at the beach, and you take a look at the quantity of people, and I could be showing you a picture of a lot of people in India, or in Pakistan, or in Turkey, or in Egypt. People. It's about people. It's about food security for these people. It's about water security in particular for these people, particularly in China uh, and India, where there are going to be substantial and already are water shortages. It's about commodity security, providing homes for these people, providing industry to employ these people. All of these aspects of the security for growing populations around the world, of course, cause countries to look beyond their own borders for security. And where does China look and where does uh, many other countries of the world look? They look to our continent here. Africa today represents about 60% of the available cropland left in the world. It's on our continent. And there has been a scramble in a sense for African land in particular. A fair amount of land on this continent has been acquired by foreign powers, foreign countries, for the extraction of agribusiness products back to their home countries. A very controversial issue across this continent is the acquisition of land, uh, fertile land, where, that agri, where the agri products are in fact not staying at home, they're leaving uh, our continental shores. China's role in Africa, as we know, has been substantial. It is now Africa's largest trading partner as a percentage of total trade. And again, the red line on the screen simply just gives you an indication visually of this dramatic rise in China's role on the African continent. In a sense, China's embrace of Africa clearly has run simultaneously with Africa's economic growth. So we could all have a discussion on whether Africa's growth in the last decade has been because of Africa or has Africa's growth in the last decade been because of this dynamic economy called China, to a lesser extent India and many other developing markets, who have put really Africa as their front burner investment destination in order to secure those commodity food uh, and water uh, security sources for themselves. And uh, we, we can debate that, of course, um, for, for, for many hours. China's role in Africa is controversial. Some see China as a, a neo-colonialist power. 
I do see China as being beneficial to Africa, but I tell you, I think China's had its outstanding decade in terms of its African uh, liaisons. I think, it's, I think it's, it's had the best of times in the last decade, and I think it's going to be a lot more difficult in a sense in future, more competitive for China, and I think there's going to be a lot more conditionality from African governments when looking at Chinese investment and infrastructure-led projects on the African continent. That's not to say that the Chinese will not be in Africa, but I think they themselves also will find themselves under pressure over the course of the next decade. What's critical, critical for Africa about China is the potential reliance that this continent has, and in particular certain countries, on the Chinese economic story. China has a voracious commodity appetite. And I put up on the screen just some of the core commodities that China uses and uses in great abundance. You know, China currently consumes 53% of all global cement in the world, uh, consumed by the Chinese. And I tell you what's fascinating is that by some estimates, China has poured more concrete for its roads, railroads, dams, bridges, factories, and skyscrapers in the three years between 2009 and 2011 than America did during the entire 20th century. Such has been the rapid uh, industrialization of China. Some might say over-industrialization of China. When you look at the figures, when you look to see that 46% of all pig products in the world are consumed by the Chinese, 37% of all eggs in the world are consumed by the Chinese, well, you have to obviously constantly watch that Chinese economic growth story to see whether there's any kind of downward trend or slope in their economy. And clearly we've seen that there has been something of a, a, a moderate drop in their GDP growth rates. The China, Chinese, I think, are in a sort of a soft landing territory. I mean, if you're going to continue, you, you won't continue to grow at 9 or 10 or 11 percent uh, for decades and decades and decades. But if you can still grow, as the Chinese are, at about 7.5 or 7.6, 7.7 percent .7 GDP per annum, in a country with 1.3 billion people, and in a country where average growth in the last number of years has been 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 percent, you are still doing remarkably well. So I think this Chinese economic story is certainly not in any danger of essentially negatively affecting the African growth story. But there's no doubt that Africa needs to be well aware, everyone doing business in Africa, every African government needs to be well aware that Africa needs to use its own resources. It shouldn't be as reliant on the outside world as I believe it continues to be, given China's big push into the continent in the last decade. Less than 30% of Africa's labor force is in stable wage-paying employment. And clearly creating that wage-paying employment, domestic employment, on the continent is absolutely critical. Africa has 12% of global oil reserves, 40% of gold, 80% of chromium, and platinum, but only 1% of global manufacturing. Only 1% of global manufacturing? You cannot continue, I believe, to have sustainable growth unless you have sustainable domestic inward investment as well and not become so reliant upon third parties or outside parties. That remains a tremendous challenge for Africa to, to provide that. And as a result, I think, despite the big and glowing and glossy GDP growth figures that I can show you, Similarly, I can show you that Africa's competitiveness, most African countries lag and lag substantially uh, in the global competitiveness report. Uh, and again, uh, whether it's the regulatory environment, the, 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 the uh, logistical environment, um, all contributing to Africa perhaps not uh, really uh, playing its rightful role as yet. There's still work to be done. For foreign business coming into Africa, Africa is rising as an attractive investment destination. Uh, and in fact, its attractiveness has uh, risen remarkably over the course of the last three years or so. And you can just see on this chart from the Ernst & Young Africa Attractiveness Report how Africa is now perceived so much more positively in the outside world. And here, of course, is the key, I suppose, the key good news, in a sense, for your industry. Average African GDP for the next 30 years could rise sixfold. Per capita income can rise above $10,000 for all African countries. Power generation capacity will need to increase sixfold to 2040. Transport volumes will increase six to eight times. Um, and in fact, uh, those volumes can increase up to 14 times for some landlocked countries. Port throughput, uh, port throughput is going to rise. 
265 million tons in 2009 to more than 2 billion tons by 2040. I mean, these are real predictions. And of course, broadband demand is going to swell by a factor of 20 by 2020 alone. I mean, a remarkable stage of development, as I've said. Notwithstanding some of the caveats or challenges that I mentioned uh, are, uh, exist on this continent. A tremendous challenge and opportunity, clearly, is in the environmental space on this continent. And indeed, when we talk about sustainability, one of the core aspects of sustainability of growth on the African continent is use of energy, demand for energy, and also resultant demand for water. And I must tell you, both are going to be extreme challenges for this continent, and both offer, I think, in terms of your industry, tremendous opportunity for investment projects in the course of the next uh, few decades. In the SADC countries closer to home, transit traffic for landlocked SADC countries are going to increase and increase dramatically as the figures indicate. Roads have improved to some degree, but rail lines are still lacking. Rail is going to be a key focus, I think. And I tell you, most regional ports are currently operating near or over capacity, causing long and very expensive delays in logistics as well. There's great work to be done, and if Africa wishes to sustain this level of growth, it will have to meet its logistical challenge that places much of Africa in the bottom rung when globally ranking countries in terms of their logistics. And I haven't got time to go through all of the figures on the table in front of you, but you know, as all of you know, it still costs to do business in Africa, and those costs are passed on to the consumer. I know I've just been, uh, I've just been in, in Malawi only in the last couple of weeks. I went into a PEP store in Malawi where I was astounded by some of the prices for t-shirts and basics in that PEP store. And if you look at the charts and you look at the graphs of what it costs to import a container, you'll just see uh, on the last, uh, the last column on that particular slide, how uh, to import a container into East Asia costs $958 per container, but in Burundi it costs $2,567. Uh, uh, in $5,000. It costs $5,000 in Burundi, $2,000 in Kenya, $2,000 in Sudan, $3,000 in Zambia, and $5,000 in Zimbabwe. So there's a long way to go, and it, you will play a role, of course in easing the infrastructure backlog, in a sense, through, of course, the corridors, gateways, and infrastructure projects that are now on the cards in Africa. And if this oil boom, I might add, comes to fruition, and we see good signs that all of these exploration uh, sites are going to come on stream, well, clearly, I'm not sure what backlog is indeed going to be adequately addressed very soon. There's going to be tremendous pent-up demand. Talking about pent-up demand, Africa's population growth over the course of the next uh, uh, 70, 80 years is going to be nothing short of phenomenal. Some see populations as very disconcerting, big population growth areas. I like big populations. I like big populations of young people, able and willing to do the work, wanting to take their countries forward. Just look at the chart. Look at the chart of the top 10 most populous countries in the world projected by the United Nations to 2100. Out of that chart, Nigeria is number three. Look at that. Just under a billion people expected to be in Nigeria at current levels of population growth by 2100. Isn't that remarkable? And look to see Tanzania, the DRC, Ethiopia, and Uganda. All 200, 300 million plus countries by 2100. The market for goods and services is in Africa. And indeed, the market for goods and services is going to be increasingly in that urban environment. I don't want anybody here in Gauteng to complain about their traffic anymore. You need a good little Sunday afternoon visit to Lagos just to give you some perspective um, in life. I mean, Africa in 2010 had 51 cities with more than 1 million residents. By 2040, they will have 100 cities of more than 1 million residents and about seven cities topping 10 million. And I tell you, when you look at the population expected of Lagos by 2050, Lagos's population will be close to 40 million people in the greater Lagos area by 2040, Kinshasa 30 million people. Um, these are massive figures, and I think massive figures that one simply can't get one's head around. The pressure on cities and urban infrastructure I think is going to cry out for business into the future if it isn't already and you should be involved in those sectors. Urbanization, I'm pleased to say, generally speaking, according to most economists, leads to rising incomes. Um, but urbanization clearly is fraught 
with problems. It's fraught with poor management, it's fraught with cost cutting, it's fraught across this continent also with substandard delivery. And I think clearly this is an issue that has to be tackled in terms of raising the quality, the quality of building, the quality of your product as well. We've seen problems with this using inferior products, in particularly, I might add, in Nigeria. And I don't mean to single out Nigeria specifically. African infrastructure is going to require billions of dollars, $90 billion per year in the next 10 years just to get that infrastructure up to scratch. And look how difficult it is to fund this infrastructure. It is estimated that it will cost more than 20 billion US dollars to improve Mozambique's ports and railways. More than 20 billion US dollars. But the GDP of Mozambique back in 2012 was 14 billion US dollars. So there's a long way to go in terms of getting uh, the infrastructure up to scratch. But nevertheless, I think your industry is going to be at the forefront of it, particularly when it comes to environmentally friendly products that I think are starting now to see uh, fruition. That might be overkill, I might add, in terms of certainly the African environment. But it gives you an idea, I think, of using the opportunity to at least make Africa cities smarter in terms of your technologies that you will discuss in this conference, the use, I think, of green technologies and smart city technologies and the liaison and working this into urban planning is going to be a critical challenge and should be one for your industry. Some companies are doing this quite effectively, I understand, and I think it is well worth pursuing. I think it's a front burner issue. Just finally, clearly, I think one of the big challenges, and we might discuss it at, on the panel, is the issue of funding and the issue of risks on the African continent. Risks associated with the delivery and operation of infrastructure projects negatively affect the cost of finances they add to cost. And unblocking important investment opportunities in infrastructure projects by involving indeed the private sector, PPPs and other public institutions, still a challenge on the African continent. So my friends, I think we are at the cusp of, uh, and I think we're in, we're not at the cusp, we're in it already of this window of opportunity for Africa to start to play a critical role in the global economy. It can do it. It has to do it from within as well. It can't just rely upon the vagaries and volatility of the global economic scene. It has to develop its own industries and it has to be smart about applying product, good standards, the regulatory and governmental environments as well domestically. Global and domestic factors therefore are now shifting Africa from being judged in the past for its vulnerabilities, as The Economist magazine did, towards being judged for its possibilities. And I must say, I'm very happy to work in any environment in which what's possible is much more exciting than what's vulnerable and what's negative. I think that's where we are currently. I wish you well in your conference. Now is the time, I think, to look at the African market. Don't wait for later. This is the unique window. Thank you very much for your attention this morning.